the classic gaming landscape is just as much about new products, new devices, and new ways to play as it is about old ones. But perhaps the one thing that has energized the core enthusiasts of the classic gaming scene the most in the past several years has been the Mr. FPGA Project. Thanks to an ever-growing group of insanely talented and passionate people, what began as a heavily do-it-yourself endeavor with a rather intimidating barrier of technical know-how has evolved into not only a relatively easy way to play games from a huge number of consoles, handhelds, classic computers, and arcade machines in a stable hardware-driven processing environment, but may also be our best shot at preserving as accurate of information as possible about the functionality of these old platforms for decades and centuries yet to come. Yikes though, this video is kind of long, isn't it? But don't worry, it's not because Mr. is difficult, it's because there is so much you can do in Mr. and there's so much to show. So if you've ever felt a bit afraid of jumping into Mr., trust me, I get it, we've been there too, and we think you'll see that it's totally something that you can use too if you can get into a can-do mindset. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at the parts that make up Mr., how to get it initialized, get the output looking great, and what's exciting about the current slate of platforms that are available to play on it as of right now in early 2022. Fans of vintage video games are truly living in an incredible era. We've seen some amazing revivals of classic series on new systems, while the original hardware these games were played on have been getting their own power-ups in the form of HDMI mods, flash carts, wireless controllers, and even more accessories. And then we have emulation. Those looking for a dose of nostalgia can grab a mini console from their local big box store to get a quick fix or dive deeper using cycle-accurate PC emulators or an all-in-one mini computer like a Raspberry Pi. But thanks to the commercial success of the AVS from RetroUSB and the NT Mini, Super NT, and Mega SG from Analog, consoles that are built around a field programmable gate array, or FPGA, have been making the most noise among hardcore enthusiasts, while also breaking through to casual fans. Using a schematic called a core, an FPGA can be reprogrammed to emulate another piece of hardware. This differs from the emulators that you see on mini consoles or a Raspberry Pi, which creates a software environment for a game to run in. Software emulation can more easily replicate relatively recent systems, but a key distinction is that hardware-based emulation can perform tasks in parallel like original hardware, rather than sequentially. This makes it easier to minimize latency in all aspects to match original hardware behaviors, from audio processing, to frame delivery, to controller inputs. It might be tempting to say that one approach is better than the other, but the fact is, there are different avenues to achieve the same goal. And how successful they are comes down to the talents and dedication of the programmers working with them, and the resources that they have available to them, as well as the capabilities of the machines running the emulation. The Mr. FPGA project began its rise to prominence in the classic gaming scene in June of 2017. Alexei Melnikov, known to most as Sorglig, or Sorg, was a key figure in the long-running development of the Mist FPGA computer project. Frustrated by its analog-only video output, Sorg sought to port many of the cores to more modern hardware, which wouldn't be hindered by this limitation. He selected the DE10 Nano as the vehicle for this project a development board which utilized a Cyclone 5 FPGA in tandem with a number of inputs and outputs, like HDMI and USB ports, along with plenty of room to expand as needed. Because the DE10 is primarily aimed at engineering students or developers looking to implement some sort of low-level device, it's been mass-produced, bringing the cost down significantly. Although chip shortages due to global pandemics have unfortunately caused the price to fluctuate. Development on the Mister was steadily on the rise before hitting a fever pitch in 2020 and 2021. Developers from all walks of life have reverse engineered and ported a staggering number of consoles, handhelds, microcomputers, and arcade games to the Mister. If it came out before 1995, chances are it's available, 
or at least in the works to some extent. Uh, I'm bad. Before we really get down to business, I need to be blunt. The Mister is an open source DIY project with a super active scene that has innumerable moving parts. Straight up, things can rapidly change on a day-to-day -day basis, which could render some of the information in this video out of date within minutes of posting it. The Mister is capable of so much cool stuff, and there's no way that we can cover everything about it in this video if we value our sanity. So we'll be going over the hardware and essential processes that you'll need to know in order to get going with your Mister. But in order to avoid overwhelming anyone with technical information, We'll be taking periodic breaks to shine a spotlight on the various platforms that the Mister currently supports. By the time you reach the end, you'll hopefully have a good idea if the Mister is for you and how to wrangle it. Because that's really the key here. While we're willing to bet that the Mister is much easier to build and use than you think, you still need to be an active participant if you want to get the most out of it. And listen, there are a lot of cores. We'd be here for another 15 hours if we gave each and every one the full deep dive treatment. So think of this as more of just an overview of each core that will hopefully answer some of your questions in terms of what kinds of games are playable and some of the interesting features that are on offer. But the cores are always evolving. So I highly recommend checking out each core's GitHub page to get the latest information on features and setup. Atari consoles, ColecoVision, any other pre-NES consoles? Raise your hand if you have any of them. All right, now keep your hand up if you actually have them hooked up and use them. A couple of you, but that's about what I expected. Even if you do enjoy games from the pre-NES era, getting a usable RF signal from unserviced consoles can be kind of difficult today. The NT Mini's jailbreak support for some of these consoles was a total game changer for me in terms of my capability to actually play and capture video from those systems, whether as HDMI or a close to authentic composite representation. And that kind of access is very valuable for anyone who writes about video games, creates videos about video games, discusses video games, or just wants to increase their own knowledge about the history of video games. And so with the Mister, there's now yet another way to explore the 70s and early 80s era of video game consoles. And who knows, you might even have a little bit of fun. The present list of pre-NES consoles playable on Mister is, and what I believe to be the order of release of the original hardware, Pong consoles, the Fairchild Channel F, Atari 2600, Bally Astrocade, Magnavox Odyssey 2, Interton VC4000, Intellivision, Emerson Arcadia 2001, Vectrex, ColecoVision, Atari 5200, and Atari 7800, which, okay, that last one was actually released after the NES, but I'm lumping it in with this lot. And remember, those are just the things that Mr. sorts into the consoles category and doesn't include other cores of crazy historical value like the PDP-1 computer core that runs Space War, the great great granddaddy of all video games. Or the cores for older home computers and early arcade machines, which will get their due later on in the video. Perhaps of most interest here is the Atari 7800 core. That's right, 7800. The Mister's standalone core for the much more famous Atari 2600 was recently shelved in favor of the 7800 core, which is considered to be more accurate than the 2600 core was. Real Atari 7800 consoles have Atari 2600 hardware on board to support full backwards compatibility, and so that hardware functionality translates seamlessly over to the Mister core, making it your one-stop shop for both platforms. It is definitely worth checking out some random stuff here. Gremlins for the 2600 is actually pretty fun in a Game & Watch sort of way. And can you believe that Ninja Golf is a real Atari 7800 game from 1990 and not a homebrew parody game made a couple of years ago? 
If you're looking to play Atari 5200 games, however, those are not compatible with the Atari 7800, and thus you'll need to use the Atari 5200 core for those. Rather than Atari, ColecoVision is actually the console of this era that I personally have a little bit of nostalgia for, so I'm really glad to see it include in the Mister. For some reason, I remember thinking that the Smurf game looked amazing back in the day. While Atari's single button joystick is iconic and is of course easy to translate functionality to any controller with a D-pad on Mister, it's worth noting that this era of console also had a variety of controllers with button setups and functionality that aren't very closely related to what is offered on modern controllers. So you may want to consider having a keyboard or alternative controller on hand to replicate number pads. And of course, paddle or spinner type controllers are another consideration. These can be replicated by an analog stick or mouse, even the touchpad on a PS4 or PS5 controller, which itself generally functions as a mouse wherever you might need it in Mister. It's not a perfect replacement for the functionality of a real spinner controller though, so I'd be curious to see if BitTrip Beat style Wii Remote gyro based paddle control might could be implemented into Mr. Core someday. After all, Wii Remotes can easily be synced to Mr. via Bluetooth. There's also the physical mode switches on the actual original consoles to consider, some of which can be mapped to buttons on Mr. or others that can be flipped via the on screen display. NES consoles and games may not be as popular to revisit as what came after, but I think it's good to have a healthy curiosity for this era of gaming, and Mr. makes for a pretty easy and flexible way to indulge that curiosity. Atari consoles are just the tip of the iceberg with the Mr. In fact, some of the most alluring game console hardware, like the Sega Genesis, Game Boy Advance and TurboGrafx-16 can all be enjoyed using it on its own. Although you'll naturally need an SD card for front-end installation and game storage. Well, a small seven-ish dollar USB hub and controller is needed to actually navigate and play the games. But let's be real here. You're probably gonna wanna take things further and there is no shortage of interesting add-ons and components for you to explore. The modular nature of the Mister may just be the key appeal of the hardware. Upgrades and expansions are a cinch. If you've ever built a PC using individually purchased parts, this is no different, except on a much smaller scale. Parts are available commercially and can be purchased from a number of sellers like Mister Add-ons, Ultimate Mister, and Mister Kits, with more cropping up all the time. Most of these sellers also offer pre-built configurations that remove the elbow grease from the equation. On the far other end of the spectrum, the hardware is oftentimes open source, so you can straight up build your own boards if you have the know-how. Regardless of the path that you choose, here's the essential components you may want to consider to get the most out of your Mister now or in the future. For my money, I'd wager that the most important component after the DE10 is the SD-RAM module. This is essential for running the rest of the cores, such as heavy hitters like Neo Geo, Super Nintendo, and Amiga. Having an SD-RAM module present will also aid in improving the accuracy of some of the cores that don't specifically require it. Over the last several years, we've seen RAM modules gradually grow in size from 32 to 64 megs. Currently, the most commonly sold module is 128 megs. Fact is, if you only have it in your budget to get one extra component, make sure it's this one because you're going to need it for most of the good stuff. Maybe ultra-sharp HDMI output is all that you're after which the Mister offers directly from the DE10. But if you're looking for a more fully featured experience, then you want to get yourself an I.O. board. Two different kinds of I.O. boards are currently available, digital and analog. For many, the analog I.O. board will unlock the ultimate capability of the Mister. Enjoy RGB or component video and audio output simultaneously with the DE10's native HDMI output. A 3.5mm audio jack can send analog audio or digital Toslink audio. Now, playing on a CRT while sending a pure digital signal to a capture card for streaming and recording is breezy and simple. 
The digital I.O. board lacks the analog outputs, but instead makes way for a full-size Toslink audio jack and a spare GPIO header, which might be useful for future expansions, like additional RAM modules. Don't fret though, if analog output is absolutely essential to you, the DE10's HDMI port is able to output analog RGB video to a PVM when coupled with an appropriate transcoder, cabling, and enabling direct video within the OS. Just note that, obviously, you won't be able to do analog and digital video at the same time. But also, if your heart desires component output, then you'll need to physically mod your transcoder. It's a bit more complex right now, to be honest. Contrary to the look, this isn't a USB at all. It's the GPIO, often referred to as the user IO port. I repeat, this is not a USB port. It's for direct connection accessories, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. On that note, the USB hub add-on can slot in underneath the DE10 Nano using a tiny bracket board and adds seven inputs for storage drives, controllers, a Bluetooth adapter, and a Wi-Fi dongle. An eighth USB port on the rear is powered only, useful for charging controllers or powering an HDMI to analog transcoder, if it needs it. This hub requires its own power feed, and many sellers offer power splitters with an inline power switch. One of these splitters isn't necessary if you've gone with a digital I.O., because it has its own power switch. Using a power coupler to connect the DE10 to the USB hub definitely gives it a cleaner look, but that might not mean much when you have things extruding from every single USB port. A word of advice though, if you are planning on filling every single port on that USB hub with different peripherals, you'll want to spring for a more capable power supply. Not that the one included is bad by any means, it's just not enough to power multiple controllers, Wi-Fi, and a hard drive all at once. The Triad WSU050-4000 comes highly recommended. It's powerful enough to handle whatever you throw at it while also being well made. And with that, oh yeah, your Mr. Voltron is pretty much complete, at least in a basic sense. There is tons of additional add-on hardware that might be appealing depending on what you're looking to play, such as a real-time clock or an audio tape input board. You'll eventually want to purchase one of the many types of cases or shells that have been created over the last several years to protect your misser from the elements and making it safer to take on the road with you. From acrylic to PCB to aluminum, there's so many gorgeous options at this point that it might be tough to settle on just one. These days, we're starting to really see a prevalence of consolized misters, like the multi-system from RMC and the ironclad from D3F mod. The Jamix I.O. board is another analog I.O. board that can fit inside of a mini ITX computer case to give it a more natural look, but it can also connect inside of an Astro City arcade machine, which is pretty sweet too. The Jamix developers even have plans to release a video processor expansion called the VideoTap, an analog video input expansion that taps into and uses the Mr.'s Ascal scaler for scaling external sources, like, say, a Nintendo 64. The Mistercade from Mr. Add-ons is a dedicated JAMA Edge equipped arcade interface board that has been intricately designed to offer robust connectivity with your arcade cabinet. It's been heavily tested and vetted by members of the Mr. community for the last couple of years. I realize that the Mr. scene is super active and there's constantly new things popping up all the time. This was a pretty broad overview on how to build a mister yourself, so you might still have some questions. So when or if you decide to do it yourself, do me a favor and look over more detailed instructions or resources that are available. Check out the description of this video for some of the outlets that we strongly suggest looking at. You never know when there might be an odd peculiarity that you need to be more mindful of, such as a switch you might need to flip on the DE10 if you're using a digital I.O. board. I don't know. This kind of information can easily get lost in the sauce in a big and broad video like this one. All I have to ask is that you believe me when I say that you can totally do this. All right, it's time to look at the Mr. Cores based on the consoles that are frankly probably the most responsible for my personal gaming tastes the Nintendo Entertainment System, and the Super Nintendo. 
One of the star features of the NES core is that, at this time, it is one of the relatively few console cores on Mr. that already supports save states with four available slots. Longtime emulator users might be aghast that Mr. doesn't have universal save state support, but implementing save states to work properly in an FPGA environment is no trivial task. Now, I have to confess, my gameplay habits tend to be a bit old fashioned, perhaps to my detriment at times, so this is a feature that I've not tested extensively. However, save state features across Mr. seem to be generally well received, and developers have told us how helpful they've been for development as well. You can map the saving and loading of states to a hotkey combo if you like, or simply do it through the menu. All official NES mapper hardware is supported on Mr., and so are most of the existing unofficial mappers. In other words, everything official is playable, and nearly all unlicensed pirate and homebrew games are playable too. Oh, and it must be noted that Famicom Disk System games work fantastically. You'll be prompted to map an FDS button on your controller, which performs the AB disk swap function. The auto disk swap option works pretty darn perfectly if you just want to get to the action, but you'll often miss hearing title screen music or seeing story scenes unless you switch to manual button-based disk swapping. The FDS audio expansion channel and all other Famicom expansion audio hardware is supported as well. The reproduction of the primary NES sound channels is exceptional based on MD Fourier analysis, and while the accuracy of expansion audio channels is difficult to verify objectively, the emulated expansion audio is among the best out there, if not the best. You can, of course, also choose your color palette, since, as you may know, converting NES colors from their original format is quite the subjective can of worms. The Mr.'s default NES palette has been recently set as the brand new Katrinx palette, which is the first NES RGB palette to be derived programmatically from the hardware logic, and the end result offers some major benefits in terms of Luma accuracy. You can also choose from a variety of popular palette mainstays from Firebrand X's Smooth to palettes that attempt to mimic how some consumer CRTs may have displayed NES composite colors. If none of the presets quite match how you personally feel NES colors should look, you can find a set of palettes compiled by friend of the show, Show. These should be included in the NES games folder from the update scripts or can be downloaded from archive.org for use on other emulators. You'll also find many of the standard features that we've come to expect from emulated NES systems, such as edge masking and overriding the sprite count limitations. If you have any interest in power pad games, you can map the 12 power pad inputs to uh, a controller with a lot of buttons or a keyboard or something. You can also enable a virtual multi-tap. One exciting thing that you can do in many Mr. Cores, including both the NES and SNES cores, is play light gun games with a mouse or other input devices over HDMI, such as a Wii Remote connected over Bluetooth combined with a third-party USB-powered sensor bar. The visible cursor, frankly, makes the games way too easy, but turning it off is tricky since the Wii Remote aiming works fundamentally differently from real light guns. On the SNES side, Super Scope games can be played in the same way. Just be sure to set the gun type to Justifier if you're playing Lethal Enforcers, but use the Super Scope mode for all other SNES light gun games, which you're gonna learn all about in our episode from October 2021. Just throwing that out there. Also check out this video from Luz Retro Source to learn more about connecting a Wii Remote to Mister and enabling it for use as a light gun across many different cores. And a bit later on, Corey will show you how to use a special Mr. accessory called Snack that lets you use original controllers on Mr., including light guns like the Zapper on a CRT. In the SNES core, you can similarly enable other controller port peripherals, including a multi-tap or mouse, which can, of course, just be a regular mouse, DualShock 4, DualSense controller, or whatever. You can set the mouse throttle to a low value in the INI config if you find it to be a bit too touchy. 
Now, some power supplies or board setups may not be able to sufficiently handle multi-tap play if you have too many USB devices plugged in. So if you experience missed controller inputs or are having trouble getting multiple controllers to work at all when setting up a two or three player session, I found that if I unplug devices that aren't needed during gameplay, like Wi-Fi adapters, then multiplayer is smooth sailing. Oh, and be sure to disable the Super Scope, mouse, and multi-tap when not using them because some games won't boot if they're detected, just as with real hardware. Several cores, including both the NES and SNES cores, even have preloaded per-game Game Genie-style codes that are super easy to activate and are updated as part of the normal update process. Those who are familiar with the history of SNES flash carts might be curious if games that use special coprocessor chips are supported by Mr. After all, it did take quite some time before games like Star Fox, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario RPG, Kirby Superstar, and others could be played via the most advanced SNES flash cartridge, the FX Pack Pro, formerly called the SD2 SNES. Luckily, that potential was eventually unleashed via the cart's FPGA, and you'll find the Mister to be similarly compatible. The only unsupported cartridge hardware are the chips used for the AI in the Hayazashi Nidan Morita Shogi games, which are also not supported by the FX Pack Pro. The only features unique to the SNES and the audio and video submenu have to do with the SNES's somewhat uncommonly used high res mode, which doubles the horizontal resolution from 256 to 512. This was sometimes used to mix sprites and backgrounds designed for the normal SNES resolution with higher resolution Japanese text to improve readability or very occasionally for higher res artwork. You can see the impact of forcing 256 pixel mode on the mister in real time, but generally you should leave this off. There's also a toggle for pseudo transparency. I was first introduced to this idea on the Super NT and it's implemented onto Mr. 2. Basically, Kirby's Dream Land 3 does transparencies via high-res dither patterns, which is super unusual for the system, and the effect really only works on consumer CRTs, but they can be made into real transparencies via emulation. As far as I know, this is only relevant for Kirby's Dream Land 3 and should be safe to leave on or off without any undesired side effects. With the NES and SNES cores, you start to get a clear image of what to expect from the Mister. We're getting closer to actually playing some games now, so let's grab an SD card and get this thing up and running. There was a time back when I first built my Mister in 2018 that setting up the SD card was well, let's just say that there was a lot of work that needed to be done in that aspect in particular. Being open source, I knew it was only a matter of time before someone would come forward with a better solution. That person ended up being Michael Smith, who we can thank for creating Mr. Fusion, a disk image that installs the basic of the Mr.'s Linux-based front end for doing almost all of the heavy lifting. All you need is, obviously, a micro SD card, the Mr. Fusion disk image downloaded from the Mr. Development GitHub, and a program that can write the image file to the micro SD. I prefer the Windows program Win32 Disk Imager, but there's plenty of other apps that do it as well. Apple Pie Baker for Mac OS and Etcher for Mac, Windows, and Linux are both listed on GitHub alongside Win32 Disk Imager. Once you've installed your Disk Imager app of choice, unzip the Mr. Fusion image file and insert your SD card. Choose the disk image and take a moment before hitting write to make sure that you've got the correct drive selected. In most cases, it might be the only option, but if you have, say, an external hard drive connected, you want to make extra sure that that's not accidentally selected because once we write that image to the disk, all contents are going to be erased. After completion, a bunch of dialog boxes might pop up on screen asking you to format the disk. This is totally normal, so just cancel out of it. Now, take that SD card out and pop it into your mister. Make sure you use the SD card on the DE10 Nano, not the I.O. board, if you have one. Power up your mister and let Mr. Fusion take it away.
After completion, you're sort of in business. This isn't the full install. It just represents the threadbare minimum that's needed for you to get into the front end and run your updater script to download the rest of the components. Of course, to even do that, you'll need something to navigate with. The easiest method here is to just use a keyboard. I personally like to use the wireless Logitech K400, but these Re mini keyboards are also pretty great. In general though, most USB keyboard is gonna work. It's also possible to use a USB controller, but you need an I.O. board to do so. Holding down the OSD button on the I.O. board will take you directly into the controller mapping interface, where you can set up the general input commands. The final piece of the puzzle is your internet connection. The DE10's Ethernet port makes this part easy to connect directly to your router, or if you have a compatible Wi-Fi USB dongle, head over to the scripts menu and launch the Wi-Fi setup script. The scripts menu is accessed by hitting escape on your keyboard or whatever you've designated as the back button on your controller. Then go down to scripts. You'll be hit with a cautionary dialog box to let you know what scripts are and what they do, but you can make that go away and never come back. Now, all you gotta do is run the update script and sit back while it does its thing downloading all the different cores and scripts that you can use. But before you do that, you'll definitely wanna consider downloading the update all script from the Ypsilon, which makes things so much easier. It is truly a one-stop shop for keeping your Mr. Current and using it is probably the most proactive thing you can do to get the most out of it. You'll notice that you can now navigate to the Mr. Data partition on the SD card when you put it into a computer. Just drop the update all script into the scripts folder in that partition. When you run the update all script on the Mr., it'll run all the original update scripts as well as a whole bunch of other ones to keep it in tip top shape. No matter what you decide to do, running either updater for the first time is gonna take a while. I'd say around like 45 minutes to an hour, but it could be longer or shorter depending on how you've set it up. There is a lot of stuff for this thing to download the first time, so just be patient. Once it's complete, hey, would you look at that? Now, I think we're ready to play some games. On the Mr. Data partition of your SD card, there's a games folder which has pre-made directories for each core. This is where you wanna put your ROMs, disk rips, virtual hard drives, and whatnot. Each core will look in its specified directory automatically by default. If your SD card just isn't big enough, you can pretty much use any XFAT formatted USB storage option. As more disc-based console cores make their way to the mister, you might need to bring in the big guns, like a portable hard drive or SSD. I personally really like these mini SanDisk flash drives, though I don't know what kind of longevity they're gonna have. They barely jut out and are currently offered up to 512 gigs. All you need to do now is create a games folder on the new drive and put the core specific folder within that. For convenience sake, I wouldn't spread a single core's games across two storage drives though. You can, but you'll have to navigate to the external storage manually. You see what I mean? The process of getting your mister ready for action is almost entirely automated. Yeah, you do have to do some work, but it's really pretty easy when you look at the big picture. If you ask me, this is a lot easier than setting up a RetroPie. The PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics Library has been one of the most fun for me to delve into in the past five or so years since I got the console. But even though I do, of course, enjoy using my real PC Engine console, in the past year, I've actually spent more time with PC Engine games on the Mister. And in fact, I've played more PC Engine games on Mister just for pleasure than I have for any other platform. One reason I've been so drawn toward playing PC Engine games on Mr. lately is the composite color palette, which actually results in more accurate colors than what I can get on my real console through my RGB mod. This is because in 2020, a number of Mr. contributors became interested in solving an overlooked problem. The PC Engine's composite colors are generated from a hardware filtering process, resulting in colors that are quite visibly different from the system's unfiltered RGB. 
Not only that, the RGB palette was never actually used by any officially released devices during NEC's time in the console market. So game artists almost certainly chose colors based on the composite output. In spite of this, RGB mods and emulators were only representing the RGB palette. So the short version of the story is that the composite palette was converted into an RGB format via reverse engineering decapped chips, something that had never been done previously, and the result was implemented into the Mr. Turbo Graphics Core as the default original color option. The other setting is raw RGB, which is what you'd see with an RGB mod or any other emulator. There are some off-shown examples, such as this scene from Startling Odyssey 2, where two steps in the sky gradient are so similar that it appears a color is missing. But this is far from the only benefit. The colors are just more accurate all around, being generally less garish compared to raw RGB. It is possible to plug this palette into some software emulators, but sadly it has not yet been widely adopted outside of Mr. I'd love to see an RGB mod for original hardware that implements the composite palette, but it would likely have to regenerate video on an FPGA to some extent for that to even be possible. Well, anyway, that might have been a lot of blabbing over what might seem like a small color difference to a lot of people, but it is seriously maybe my single favorite feature that can be found in any Mr. Core and is a real testament to the Mr. Development community's dedication to completeness and accuracy. As far as other tweaks go, toggle on the TurboTap setting if you want to play multiplayer, because in case you didn't know, PC Engine and Turbo Graphics systems only have a single controller input. You can also set your controller to a six button layout for the few games that support it, like Street Fighter II Champion Edition but this can cause some weirdness in other situations, so you should save it with two buttons set as your default. If you're wondering how to activate Turbo Fire, well, did you know that the Mister actually has Rapid Fire built in as a standard feature across the board? Just hold down the button that you want to enable it on and press the menu button. You can also adjust the rapid fire interval in steps from between 32 and 1024 milliseconds by holding the D-pad up or down and tapping the menu button. But the problem I see with the current implementation in the case of PC Engine and Turbo Graphics games in particular is that it seems impossible to exactly match the rapid fire rates and consistency of real NEC controllers. However, I did happily discover that you can use the USB controllers from the NEC PC Engine or TurboGrafx Mini consoles, and the turbo functionality from those seems like an exact or very close match to the original hardware behavior. The Mister's TurboGrafx Core supports both Hue Card and CD games. That includes Super Graphics Hue Card games, which is good for preservation, although only the smallest handful of games were made for that hardware. However, you should most definitely not overlook the PC Engine CD library and assume it's all just dated FMV games and stuff like that. It's absolutely chock full of platformers, shooters, RPGs, and other standard genre fare, but taking advantage of the extra storage and streaming audio capabilities. On Mr., we have run into issues with CD games a couple of times. While playing Valis 2 on a stream this past September, the game simply failed to load the next scene during a cutscene and I was stuck. But luckily that game automatically saves your progress and I was able to resume straight from the beginning of the cutscene, which did not lock up on the second pass and the rest of the game proceeded without issue. So there have been some small hiccups in our experience with CD games along the way, but not especially recently. So it's possible that the functionality is still getting closer and closer to perfection. One pool of internal backup RAM is created for each game that supports save functionality, which should be a huge relief to anyone who knows what a pain in the butt it is to manage saves on original hardware. There is an option under hardware to speed up CD seek times, which probably works fine, but I've always been distrustful of anything like that, all the way back to playing PS1 games on PS2, whether that's rational or not. Oh, and do note that you can toggle on the arcade card for games that are enhanced by or require it, like Sapphire and Mad Stalker, but a handful of games may need this left off. 
You can also optionally boost CD and ADPCM audio for situations like Gate of Thunder, where under normal circumstances, the soundtrack is mixed in rather low and can be easily drowned out by the sound of your guns and explosions. It's also worth noting that the PC Engine Core, like several others, has had its audio extensively checked against MD Fourier, with appropriate adjustments that have made it quite accurate. PC Engine audio is often emulated rather poorly, and if that's the only way you've ever heard it, I think you'll be impressed by how good the PC Engine's natively generated PSG sound can be. Straddling the worlds of arcade and console, the Neo Geo Core is categorized as a console on the Mr.'s main menu. As one of gaming history's most enticing yet prohibitively expensive platforms, the Neo Geo Core was not only one of the most exciting platforms to be had in the Mr.'s first waves of massive development activity, but to my knowledge, it is one of the few console cores to be built largely from information gleaned by decapping the original silicon resulting in documentation and performance that is considered to be just about as accurate of a replication of the original hardware as could ever be possible. As you'd expect, both arcade-focused MVS ROMs and home port AES ROMs are supported, and they take a bit longer to load than ROMs from most other consoles. There's also memory card save functionality implemented, but I have to admit I don't know much about how memory cards are used in any Neo Geo game. Unfortunately, support for Neo Geo CD games is not available on Mr. at this time, and any plans to implement are uncertain. Unibios and Original BIOS are both supported, but Unibios makes it easier to play any version of a game. If you want to alter the game and hardware behavior, simply be sure that the settings dip is turned on before loading a game. This will take you to the Neo Geo BIOS menu, and the main thing you'll be interested in is the soft dip. Whichever button you set as A is confirm, while C is cancel. You can change lives, alter the difficulty level, set maximum time on gameplay timers, change the language, region, turn blood on, off, stuff like that. The Neo Geo A button raises values, while B decreases values. When you back out to exit the BIOS screens, you'll be prompted to turn off DIP1, which of course you do through the Mr. Menu. The game will then proceed to boot up with the settings you selected. Metal Slug Axe. This whole process may seem strange to some, but this is exactly how you use real Neo Geo arcade hardware, and even consoleized MVS hardware like I have here. The only difference is being physical DIP switches versus menu-based toggles. Although Unibios does have a feature for accessing the settings screen during boot up by pressing the buttons you've assigned as B, C, and D, but on Mr. I found this shortcut to not work without extra fiddling, so to me the settings dip just seems easier to use in this case. The other dip switches in the menu are for turning on free play mode if you aren't looking for a challenge, as well as for freezing the game. Handy, since these are arcade games and are not intended to be paused in their natural habitat. It would definitely be nice to see the ability in the future to map the freeze dip to a controller button, or at least for it to toggle on and off when opening or closing the Mr. Menu. Okay, so before we leap feet first into the video output settings and stuff like that, let's do a quick rundown of some little odds and ends of the front end that are generally good to know about. You may have already noticed, but the Mr.'s interface is almost entirely text and list based. 
The analog experience with all its different sliders and granular value adjusters, this is definitely not. At least it's dressed up in such a way that it's really, really easy to navigate. First, let's change up the static fuzz background on the main menu. Pressing F1 on your keyboard will let you toggle through some colorful options for the HDMI out. It's also possible to change the analog out, but that takes a bit more work, which I won't be getting into in this video. If you want to customize it a little bit more, you can add different wallpapers to the menu by putting some images into the wallpaper folder on the SD card. We're really digging the My Favorite Sandwich by Pepe Salo, which can be downloaded via his Twitter. The first thing you're going to see is the Cores menu, which obviously can be used to choose what you want to play. But there's also some hardware testing programs in the utility directory, while other contains some odds and ends to mess around with. Hitting the cancel button on your controller will take you to the system settings page, which shows you some vital information such as your OS version and remaining available storage on your SD card. The first thing highlighted here is the switch to USB, which I promise you has tripped up every single person using a mister at least once. This option is for advanced users who want to put certain config files on the USB storage as opposed to the SD card. For a vast majority of users, this isn't needed at all. But I guarantee you, you'll accidentally hit this at some point and panic when you see a basic static screen declaring no files. To get back to familiar territory, just hit cancel and select switch to SD card. The system settings also allow you to remap a keyboard and define joystick buttons. This mapping is applied to all cores by default, but you'll be able to further customize these settings within each core. Joystick mapping is remembered on a per controller basis, which is pretty handy if you want to use specific controllers for specific cores. If you create a custom button layout within each core, don't forget to save your settings so that it remembers it for the future. Actually, this is a really important thing to remember when committing setting changes in any core. I think that the 8-bit DOE M30 2.4G wireless controller is a pretty great catch-all controller and it comes with its own receiver but I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it's a suitable replacement for serious Super NES gaming. If you want to stay wireless using Bluetooth, you're going to need to get a USB Bluetooth receiver. The PlayStation 5 DualSense controller works extremely well over Bluetooth, both in terms of input lag and, check it out, you can even use the trackpad for certain games. You can also connect directly over wired USB. This is absolutely amazing for arcade sticks and whatnot. You'll want to jump into the scripts directory, you know, the one where we ran the updater from, and run the fast USB polling on script, which will help reduce, but not completely eliminate some of the inherent lag that plagues all USB controllers. Mr. Addons has put together a really fantastic resource that has hard numbers when it comes to measured input latency of a wide range of USB controllers. Check it out and see how your favorite USB controller measures up. A little while ago, Try mentioned the ability to use light guns with the Mister. The way that the Mister is able to achieve this is due to this weird little dongle called SNAC. S -N -A -C. This stands for Serial Native Accessory Converter and has a USB on one end and an HDMI input on the other. The USB end plugs into the user I.O. port on the Mister, either directly or through a USB extension cable if you want to lessen the stress of gravity on the port. The other end is where the console-specific pigtail adapters plug in, which, oddly enough, use HDMI connectors. Who would have expected that? I'll admit that it's pretty slick. Once connected, by activating Snack under Serial Mode in the Input Options menu, you can now use each console's light guns when playing on a CRT television. The pigtails are sold separately and are offered for a variety of consoles, so just get the ones that you think that you'll need. Of course, there's also all-in-one Snack adapters if you only need one specific type. The secret to how Snack works is that the user I.O. port has direct access to the FPGA, which means that there's no more lag than you'd have with a real console. And yes, you can use original controllers with Snack for a lagless experience. Those of you that are especially sensitive to USB controller lag, this is a solution you've been waiting for. The only catch is that you can't navigate the Mister's menu system with a Snack controller, so keep your USB controller nearby for that. 
The addition of CD consoles to the Mr.'s repertoire reveals a separate issue that might not have been a problem up to this point. File size, and of course, the media. Some CD games can be up to 650 megs, which will eat up storage rapidly if you have a big library. This is where CHD file compression steps in. Initially developed by the team behind MAME, CHD files are made up of losslessly compressed hunks of data. This will take your CD games and generally cut the file size in half. But it does take a bit of work to get it done. Place the CHD man script inside of a folder containing your bin and queue, or ISO, and run it. After it does its magic, you'll have a single .chd file remaining. Another cool space-saving tip is that you can navigate .zip files natively in the OS. That is, zip files only, not 7Z or anything like that. This is especially great for systems like the Atari 2600, which have tons of these little 1 meg files which can take pretty much forever to copy over to an SD card. This is only intended for ROM files, and it does not work on CD games or VHD files or anything like that. Of course, you'll likely need additional storage space in the future. More advanced users might want to store games on a network-attached storage pool, like a Synology NAS or Retro NAS. You can find your MISTER's network-assigned IP address on the MISC option screen. Get there by pressing left at the system settings. And finally, to quickly touch upon a subject that's near and dear to my heart, save files are stored on the SD card inside of the saves folder under their respective core. The save files on the MISTER are named the same as the ROM and use a .sav file extension. Certain systems, like the SNES, might be as straightforward as dragging, dropping, and renaming save files from your flash cart or ROM dumper of choice. But others, like those from the Sega Genesis, might need to be converted before they'll work on the MISTER. Fellow save file enthusiast, Ewan Forrester, has been working on savefileconverter.com, a web app designed to convert saves between platforms, from original hardware to Wii Virtual Console and even the MISTER. You could even download saves from the internet and use them to unlock extra characters or levels. Not every device is supported just yet, but this sure as heck takes the guesswork out of the equation for the end user. There is one critically important factor to save files that can trip you up if you're not careful. By default, save files are not written to the SD card, which means that if you quit a game or power off the system, your save file is gone. That is, unless you commit the save file to the SD card by going into the OSD within a game and selecting Save Backup RAM. Streamline this by changing the Auto Save option to On, and it'll write the save RAM file to the SD card every time you open up the OSD. I personally recommend making a practice of going into it every single time you save your data. If you enable the Auto Save function within a core, remember what I said earlier, and save your core settings to set it and forget it. For games that have a password system, a cool tip is to use the Mr. Screenshot tool. If you have a keyboard handy, hold down the Windows key and press Print Screen to store a screen grab in the Screenshots folder on the SD card. And lastly, if you're scratching your head on how something works, the recently added built-in help section in the System Settings tab is a perfect resource for all things Mr. And <laughs> I think that about covers it when it comes to the basics. Some of that wasn't exactly critical knowledge or anything, but it's just good to have that floating around somewhere in your brain in case you need it. Now, I am gonna go grab myself a cup of coffee while Try jumps in and breaks down some of the more important system-wide video options for you. So, I'll admit, when I got my mister, it was already all put together and ready to go. So unlike Corey, I don't have hands-on experience with putting it together from scratch, but hopefully he's shown that the construction and initial setup doesn't have to be so scary. But you know, speaking for myself, I'm not really all that excited by or interested in the DIY aspect of mister. I just want to use it. And I suspect a lot of you might feel that way too. But here's the thing. No matter whether you start your Mr. Adventure from step one or you just skip ahead to the end game by buying a pre-built unit or getting help from a friend who can 
figure out how to put one together. I'm just saying all this to assure you that I understand the trepidation. I was kind of afraid of even just using mine at first, to be honest. I barely touched it for a long time. But I've since come to really enjoy it as a conveniently portable, versatile, and accurate way to play a huge range of games. And so I want to show you some of the universal settings that apply across the entire system and how it outputs video. The Mister references a .ini config file on the SD card, which determines how the system operates. But you know me, I'm a console gamer, so I hate tweaking settings via text editors and stuff like that. So luckily, there's a script called INI settings that lets you edit the INI file directly through the Mister itself with a simple graphical interface, although admittedly, this can look a little scary at a glance too, so I'm here to help. Let's first take a look at this group of settings and how it pertains to analog video since there's less to say about it compared to digital video. If you're connecting Mister to a 15 kilohertz CRT like a standard television or PVM, you'll need a cable that goes from D-sub to SCART, BNC, or RCA component. For RGB video, the order here should be off, 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 on. Or if you're using component video, you'll want to be sure that YPBPR is turned on. Unfortunately, composite and S-video are not supported very robustly, if at all, by most Mr. Analog I.O. boards at this time. So if authentic looking composite video is a must for you, original hardware is still your best bet for now. For people in North America, component is most likely the best and easiest analog connection. If you search for VGA to component cable, you'll probably find Monoprice's version of this or something similar, but do note that despite the name and appearance, it is not a VGA to component converter. It's simply a straight cable that carries the signal being output by the device, which in this case would generally be 240p YPBPR if you configured things in the way I just described. As Corey already mentioned, if your mister uses a digital I.O. board with no analog connectivity, you can still get authentic 240p analog video via the HDMI port. The key is to turn on the direct video function. It's sort of like how the analog DAC creates 240p analog signals via the HDMI ports of those consoles. But in the case of Mister, no one to our knowledge is currently selling a purpose-built cable or converter for the direct video feature. So cobbling together the right video chain for this is a bit of an advanced user feature at the moment. But back to the analog I.O. boards. You can also configure the analog port to output a signal that would indeed work on any run-of-the-mill computer monitor with a VGA connector. All you need is a straight VGA cable, and to disable the VGA scaler, enable the force scan doubler, disable YPBPR, and disable composite sync. This arrangement converts the typical 15 kHz signals that Mr. Cores generate into 31 kHz RGB HV, which is fantastic when viewed on a CRT computer monitor. But be sure to turn off the force scan doubler in most other situations, as it can cause issues even over HDMI output, such as an incorrect application of certain video filters like LCD screen effects, or a visible blip when some SNES games switch between 256 and 512 horizontal resolution modes. And you know, I do suspect that most people are planning to use the HDMI port as their primary means of connectivity. So. Let's take a look at what we can do here to maximize the Mr. scaling and video processing potential via HDMI. Nineteen twenty by ten eighty at sixty hertz, ten eighty p is a safe resolution choice. But you can also use higher resolution settings like nineteen twenty by fourteen forty if you have a compatible display. The 2048 by 1536 setting exists specifically for repurposed iPad display panels with custom HDMI input drivers. Finding these high-res 4.3 aspect ratio screens tends to involve digging around on AliExpress, but they can be pretty neat for a more compact, portable option or a custom build, like with the CRT-styled frames from LaserBear.net. 
With the second and third menu items, you can optionally choose separate output modes for NTSC and PAL content, but I strongly recommend leaving these alone. Because with the way the script currently works, you can't simply revert an item back to undefined status. So if you do set these, then they might conflict with the primary output setting, which has led to me being confused why I was sometimes getting undesirable results. But if you do have these set and want to get rid of them, then you'll have to either hit right to go to the advanced editor and delete them directly with a keyboard, or do the same via notepad or a similar program on your computer. VSync Adjust is a buffering setting that helps with display compatibility. With this set to 2, low lag, the Mister's HDMI output works much the same way as upscalers like the OSSC and RetroTINK 5X in that the output refresh is the same as the original hardware, which may clash with the expectations of some digital display devices. Based on anecdotal evidence, I believe that most displays from recent years should handle most refresh rates that the Mister's various cores would output, so the low lag setting should be just fine most of the time. But if you are running into trouble with getting the image to appear and remain stable, try setting the VSync Adjust to zero match display frequency. You might have to do this with arcade cores in particular, since arcade games often run at refresh rates that are even further off the 60Hz mark than consoles typically are. Or if you know the specific range of refresh rates that are causing you issues, you can set the minimum and maximum refresh rates that are allowed to be used. We're almost done here, so don't feel overwhelmed just yet. Be sure that the V-Scale mode is set for zero. Scale to fit the screen height to unlock robust scaling options that are available within the per core options for many cores. You should also be aware that Mr. outputs a full range RGB format over HDMI by default. If you feel like dark details are being crushed or highlights are being clipped to white, try adjusting your display or capture card RGB range or black level settings. If that doesn't work, then changing the HDMI limited setting to 1, the on value, should bring your video levels into the correct range. The last HDMI related INI tweak I want to mention is for the item marked HDMI Audio 96K, which is disabled by default. The standard 48kHz audio is highly compatible and is all well and good, but sometimes the cores use lower sample rates, like 32kHz for Game Boy or 44.1kHz for CD audio. So you may notice a cleaner sound from certain cores when using the higher 96kHz HDMI audio rate. If your equipment accepts it, then you may as well use it, so give it a try. Oh, and by the way, if you turn on the VGA scaler mode, then all the settings that you use for HDMI will also output in the same way over the analog VGA output. This might be useful if you have a high-end VGA monitor and want to take advantage of the more advanced per-core scaling settings that are designed for HDMI output, since those features can't be used with the standard analog output modes. Overall, I've personally had great success using the INI setting script, but I have been told that it isn't really kept in regular maintenance these days, which confuses me because what if your mister isn't always connected to the network? Or what if you have an enclosed case where your micro SD card isn't readily accessible? How would you change settings then? I'll agree that the Mr.'s INI file is not that difficult to edit manually compared to similar settings files for other hardware or software, but the fact of the matter is that over here in console land, we like menus. So I would like to encourage the Mr. Development community to continue to keep the INI settings script up to date in the interest of expanding Mr.'s accessibility, and perhaps, if possible, to eventually migrate these key settings into the Mr.'s main graphical user interface and not hide it behind a script. So I haven't lost you yet, have I? The INI settings menu, yeah, it's hardly the most exciting or comforting thing to look at, but just like a motherboard BIOS screen, the average user really won't have to tinker with it all that often. So if you just take a second look over what I've shown here, I think you'll do just fine. Oh, and one more thing. Note that the INI settings script only edits the main INI profile, but you can have multiple profiles on hand if you're willing to duplicate, rename, and edit the INI files via a text editor on a computer. 
So with those on the SD card, you can then jump between profiles from the main Mr. Dashboard by pressing whatever button you've assigned as cancel or back, pressing left, and then choosing main, alt one, alt two, or alt three profiles. If the INI config you happen to be on isn't compatible with the connected screen, you can also use hotkeys to switch between these profiles by holding the cancel button and pressing left, right, up, or down on the D-pad. But if you aren't using your mister on a variety of unusual displays, then honestly, you can mostly just forget about all this and just use a singular main profile. I mean, that's what I did up until now. Don't tell anyone. Due to the relative similarity of hardware between the Sega Master System and Game Gear, both occupy the same core. This makes complete sense to me, but it also means that you'll run into certain settings that only apply to one platform, most of which are housed under the audio and video section. The FM sound capability of the Master System via an expansion module is the first example that comes to mind, containing a real Yamaha YM2413 synth chip Although I tend to prefer the system's original PSG sound, it's been nice seeing FM sound emulation becoming such an integral part of different ways to play Master System games. The Mister's integration of FM sound is noteworthy because it uses the real instrument patch data extracted from the YM2413 chip to generate the FM tones. Without this information, developers had to more or less guess what it should sound like and go from there. By all means, FM sound should be closer to the original hardware as it's ever been. But as of right now, no Master System version of MD Fourier exists, and without the hard numbers that only it can provide, you might find that accuracy is contested by some. Keep in mind that a game's music mode can't be changed on the fly in real time. You'll have to reset the game from the menu for it to kick in. On the video side, most Master System games generally have a big old fat border surrounding the game image. On a CRT, this was mostly hidden by the overscan, but via HDMI, it can be a real eyesore. This border can be switched off in the AV settings for a more pleasing image on your HDTV. However, this isn't always an easy one-and-done solution, since some SMS games are 256 pixels wide, and some are 248, which gives us a solid colored column of 8 pixels on the left-hand side. Some games even use both resolutions from screen to screen. Fantasy Star is a good example of not just a timeless classic, but also of a game that uses both resolutions. The first-person sections use the full 256, while the overhead maps are 248. For these edge cases, the masked left column setting comes to the rescue. BG is the default, leaving the column as is. This is how the situation is commonly addressed in emulators and other re-releases. <laughs> Setting this to black is a much cleaner workaround though. This goes a long way to making transitions between resolutions nearly indistinguishable. Still, if you feel compelled to just lop off the column entirely, well, you can do that by choosing Cut. But this will stretch out the 248 pixel wide games to 256. If you go with this, be sure to load up some interpolation in the video processing tab to smooth out the unevenness. Try will tell you about that in a little bit here. Although it's not really a big deal, I appreciated that the border options are mirrored on the analog video output. What can I say? It just looks nice. Sprites per line gets rid of the sprite limitation and makes games with intense flicker more visually appealing. The most egregious example I could think of off the top of my head is R-Type. What a difference, right? A couple of other minor features are worth mentioning for Master System games. Although it's not required, the BIOS is there for those who get nostalgic over the SMS boot-up sound, or if you just want to play one of the built-in games from different systems, like Snail Maze. 
And finally, mappers, like those used to enhance the capabilities of NES games, were also in Master System games. I had no idea for the longest time. The core will handle everything mapper-related for a relatively seamless experience, but who knows when you might just come across a game that will cause it to fail. In this case, you'll just want to toggle on the Disable Mapper setting. Removing the forced 3D in games like Maze Hunter 3D is the perfect use for the built-in cheat functionality. But this makes me wonder. I realize it's absolutely ridiculous, but could the audio tape input board be made to work with the Sega 3D glasses? I mean, it uses a 3.5 millimeter plug. Now, you might be surprised to hear that there are no Game Gear specific options in this core to speak of. Or then again, maybe you're not. When you boot up a Game Gear title, certain aspects like FM sound are straight up grayed out. Border options remain available, but changing these settings won't have any visual effect on Game Gear games. I'm guessing it's possible that some obscure hack might need it, or it could be related to Game Gear games that run in Master System compatibility mode, like Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse. Since the Game Gear's resolution was only 160 by 144 that means that the game image will be surrounded by a large black border when played through analog video. This is exactly the same as using a video out from a real hardware mod, such as the Mickwheel LCD RGB output. I'll say though, setting the sprites per line to all in the technically impressive Gunstar Heroes Game Gear port goes a long way in removing most of the flicker. And there, there's a lot, trust me, that's really saying something. So simply put, there's just not a whole lot to consider with Game Gear games at this point in time. Which, you know, now you have more time to play some Popeye Beach Volleyball. Yep, I hear ya. What about SG-1000 games? I can confirm that this is indeed possible here in the Master System Core. Oddly enough, the hardware between the two systems were so close that SG-1000 games are also playable in the ColecoVision Core. Two places to play Dragon Wang on the Mister. Does it get any better than this? As we've been made well aware of over the years, the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive is one of the more finicky systems to emulate correctly. We've seen plenty of options over the last decade, many sub subpar, but also some extremely good ones. But one thing is for certain, there's always been tons of quirks to consider when it comes to getting the system right. Alas, the Genesis Core has enjoyed some lavish attention, making it one of the absolute best cores available right now. Most of the stuff looks awfully familiar, huh? Like the SMS, a fair share of Genesis games have a big colored border around the image that can be turned off. Some games even have these tiny little flashing CRAM dots in the border somewhere near the bottom of the screen. Yeah, these are totally 100% inconsequential, but I'm glad that they're there because I've become so used to their presence that it's a big part of the authenticity for me. More people would likely say that the Genesis's dirty composite video signal is a bigger part of the authenticity for them and is a key part of the Genesis experience overall. The Mister's current lack of an easy composite video output option puts a lot of pressure on the core's composite blend setting. The results are not what I consider to be all that accurate right now. The key challenge is to make the effect ultra cruddy, but <laughs> not too cruddy. Trust me, it takes a fine balance to look that bad while also looking good. The main benefit of this is the dither blurring which can make certain graphics, like the waterfalls and Sonic, look more transparent instead of a fine screen door. You're not gonna get any of the rainbow effects that you see with a real Genesis composite signal. <laughs> the adaptive setting for composite blend is more interesting. This will selectively blur certain elements while maintaining clarity on everything else. I guess it's sort of like the pseudo-transparency setting in the SNES core. Check out what it does to the smoke in the what-the-heck level in Earthworm Jim. But remember, this setting isn't perfect, 
and it might end up blurring some graphics where you don't really want it to, or causing other weird anomalies. A neat side effect is that the composite blending modes are reflected on the analog output, so you can play an RGB or component while also enjoying some benefit of a dirtier video signal. Aside from this, I think it's the Genesis audio enthusiasts that are the big winners when it comes to the Mr. Core. First of all, you can choose between the YM2612FM chip from the Model 1 system or a ym 3438 fm chip from a Model 2. And then you can even apply filters that are tuned to specific models of the console. This is great for authenticity, especially since MD Fourier has been used to create these presets. But mixing and matching these can also be a fun look or uh, listen into different what if scenarios. In fact, some people argue that the Model 2's YM3438 sounds better than the YM2612 when not saddled with the Model 2's poor filtering. So play around with this and even remove the filtering if you like. Hi-Fi PCM enables the full bit depth of PCM audio, which might sound more pleasing to some people. But if you're not an audiophile and you just want a suggestion, then the default YM2612 with Model 1 filtering is generally considered the Canon Genesis sound. But whatever combination you choose, how cool is it that these options have been developed and you can cycle through them and hear the differences in real time? Although it'll actually take an acutely trained ear to really pick out some of the subtleties. General compatibility is about as robust as you'd expect. There's support for the SVP chips, so virtual racing is a go. As are larger unlicensed games like Pure Solar. It'll also correct the music speed automatically in games where it's slowed down on some Model 2 consoles, like in Hellfire. The Mega CD core dropped near the end of 2019, finally giving us our first taste of a CD-ROM console core on the Mystic. But why the heck isn't this integrated into the Genesis core? Well, my understanding is that there currently isn't enough space on the FPGA for both the Genesis and Sega CD plus the SVP chip used in Virtua Racing. It's entirely possible this could change later on, as the cores are optimized more, sort of like how it was with the TurboGrafx-16 and the Super CD-ROM add-on. Really quickly, I just want to say that I really appreciate how the little lights on the I.O. board flash just like the read and ready lights on the Sega CD Model 1. I instantly recognized it, and it brought a big smile to my face. So most of the features of the Genesis Core are carried over here, which means that there isn't actually a lot to cover right now. The only real obvious forward-facing new addition is an option to filter the CD audio sound. At this time, there aren't any settings for disk loading speeds or any of the other goodies that Sega CD-capable flashcards currently offer. Loading does seem to be a little bit faster than original hardware, although I'm not sure if this could cause problems with some games. Game save storage is also never a problem because the core will create a pool of internal memory for each game. Or, if you need additional space, you can add a RAM cart on top of that. If you're fixing to play Pure Solar with the CD audio, the Sega CD Core is the place to do it. Just rename the game ROM file to cart.rom and put it in the same folder as all your RIP CD audio or the CD image. Fan-made MSUMD games, meaning cartridge games with CD soundtracks, are also supported in a similar fashion.
So I'm sure that more refined CD-specific settings are planned, but the author, SRG320, is currently busy working on the Saturn core. Still, what's here is more than enough to keep you from having to deal with aging and oftentimes finicky original Sega CD hardware. While there isn't a core for the 32X at this point in time, I wouldn't file that away as an impossibility just yet. The ambition of this community seems to have no limit, and I'm sure it's only a matter of time. So we've gone over the I and I settings, but that is not all we can do in terms of tweaking how the output looks. So now we're ready to get into the audio and video settings within the individual cores, where we can see the results of our tweaking in a much more immediate and tangible fashion. After launching a core, press whatever you've set as the main Mr. Menu button to bring up the core menu. See how it says SNES on the left-hand side? That means that this page offers settings specific to running the Super Nintendo Core. You'll see some miscellaneous settings by pressing to the left of the core page, and then to the right, you'll see the system page, which is more or less a unified setup that offers very similar features across basically all cores. While the specific settings do vary from core to core, there is an ongoing push towards developers standardizing their presentation across the board as much as possible to continue making each Mr. Core feel more and more like part of a unified platform. Now, the actual video scaling settings tend to be on the middle page, the core settings page. For the major home consoles, at least, you'll usually see an audio and video section, and within it, some settings that may be very specific to that platform, and others that are more general. For now, we're mainly looking at the items marked Vertical Crop, Crop Offset, and Scale. Assuming you have the INI file's vScale mode set to zero, as I recommended, you'll have access to the same selection of settings I have here. And by the way, it's totally normal for your display to lose sync for a moment while flipping through these because you're changing how the video is generated in real time. Also, keep in mind that most of the settings we're looking at from here on only apply to HDMI output unless, of course, you're using the VGA scaler mode. Normal scale will retain the original aspect ratio and fill the vertical screen space with all of the emulated console's useful rows of resolution. For example, the yellow areas I've drawn here are part of the SNES's full 240p signal, but are almost always unused. So normal scaling takes advantage of this by cropping the useless lines and providing a larger picture. Meanwhile, V integer will use the largest vertical integer scale possible for the selected output resolution while also maintaining the original aspect ratio. This would typically be a 4x vertical scale if you're using 1080p, but the resulting picture can be a bit small. Narrower HV integer and wider HV integer settings use integer scales for both horizontal and vertical scaling. This can be useful if you're used to playing these older games with square pixels, but that's typically not quite the proportions they will have been displayed at on a CRT television. So of these options, I'd rather go for normal or V integer to preserve the original aspect ratio and then to polish up any uneven pixels with some interpolation, which I'll show you how to do in just a moment. You'll also see a vertical crop toggle for most consoles. Instead of displaying the typical 224 lines, this throws away just eight rows of resolution, resulting in what the menu terms as 216p, which is a 5x scale when using 1080p. The practical result is that the game image is bigger, and usually game designers would have considered that pixels so close to the edge would likely be lost in a CRT's overscan area, so most games do work very well with this 216p format. In cases where something is cut off, like the selection arrow at the bottom of the HUD in Conquest of the Crystal Palace on NES, you can adjust the crop offset to bump the picture up or down. The short version is this. When using 1080p, I recommend either the 5x vertical crop mode or simply the normal scale that fills the screen. 
for other resolutions like 720p or 1440p, the integer or normal are both great starting points for getting our picture settings just right. You might also consider checking out other core specific sizing options like the 320 by 224 aspect correction in the Genesis core, which I personally don't use since I like to stay true to CRT image proportions, but I understand why people would want to use it since Genesis art was often drawn in such a way that results in things like intended spheres being ovals when displayed at 4.3 rather than true circles. Also note that scaling options in arcade, handheld, and computer cores might variously be presented similarly or rather differently, so I'll leave it to you to explore those on your own. What we've done here is just an exercise in exploring the basics with everyday 240p console games used as the examples. Now that we have the picture size just the way we want using core specific scaling settings, let's solve the problem of non-integer scaling that we may have ended up with in the horizontal and or vertical axes. Remember that the right hand system settings page tends to offer pretty similar stuff across most cores, whether that's a standard console core, an arcade core, or whatever. And here we see the video processing section. Until recently, this was simply a single setting for a video filter, but now there's an entire subsection where you can choose several things. This might look complicated, and truthfully, it is. But luckily for all parties involved, you won't have to hear the original rant I wrote about my trials, tribulations, and ultimate failure to get positive results through this system, because in the middle of the production of this video, a super handy preset section was added. Now, seeing as the presets are really new, there aren't a lot of them, but for now at least, we can get straight to some really excellent results without much fuss at all. But which to choose? Well, through our actions in the core scaler menus, we have unwittingly summoned the Dread Fiend, known as Scrolling Shimmer. Curses! We thought we were doing right by filling the vertical screen space and maintaining a 4-3 aspect ratio. But do not doubt our actions, chosen hero. For not only were they indeed good and correct, you possess the magic of interpolation, the power to seal the beast. By simply choosing the preset named interpolation only, you'll load in a filter file called GS Sharpness 085. Now the pixels, which previously wriggled and writhed due to being of uneven width and height, all appear to be uniform in size, with just a touch of softening to both the horizontal and vertical scaling that still maintains a sharp overall appearance. Just think of it as anti-aliasing for pixel graphics. Now, people who are even more sensitive to scrolling shimmer than me may possibly still feel like the sharp interpolation doesn't go far enough, in which case you might try manually changing out the first filter for interpolation medium which is just a touch softer than I'd prefer. And if you still see some sort of shimmering here, then your display's pixel response speed may be a contributing factor. And you can play around with other filters too on this first line if you're more into smoothed pixel graphics. Perhaps to use, say, a bilinear filter from the normal upscaling folder, and then to go back to the core's audio and video settings to combine that with the HQ2X skin doubler effect. I know that some of you are loving what you're seeing here. I mean, hey, I showed you how to do it, so I ain't trying to say that you shouldn't if it makes you happy. My personal recommendation for most users, especially if you record or stream your gameplay, is to apply the interpolation-only preset to every core you use. Although for square pixel cores like Game Boy and GBA, you could get away with just applying the no filters preset, which once again does hard edged nearest neighbor scaling, but that will only work correctly if you're also using vertical integer scaling. Personally, I'd take the slightly larger interpolated picture, but that's up to you. In general, this type of sharp interpolation is exactly how I personally like my retro images scaled 95% of the time. 
Whether that's on FPGA system, software emulator, or RGB or component video via an upscaler. They can all produce extremely similar results when you use filters and interpolation correctly, and Mr. hangs with the best of them. But let's not forget that we are living in a time of incredible advancement in CRT scanline effects on FPGA-based hardware, such as what we've seen with the RetroTINK 5X upscaler and the N64 Digital HDMI mod. This is where Mr. was, and perhaps still is, at a considerable UI disadvantage given its file and list-based tweaks versus simple sliders. I mean, I'll be honest, I really struggled to cobble together any satisfactory CRT or scanline effects with the different filter layers on my own. It is extremely difficult to use. So this is where the presets really save our butts. Of the current set of presets, I like the ones labeled Scanlines Medium and Scanline Soft, which do not use a CRT shadow mask, as well as the high contrast MG and Sony Trinitron presets from the display specific folder, which do go for more of the CRT look. I definitely think softer scaling is the way to go when using scan lines. It really helps sell the look. Some settings may look slightly uneven when not using a vertical integer scale, while others should look just fine at any scale. So just play around with the presets and see what looks right on your display. And keep in mind that while these are totally great to use for your own enjoyment, scanline effects usually look poor in streams or online videos, so I still recommend using interpolation only when streaming or recording. And also remember, unless you're specifically using the VGA scalar mode, None of this applies to analog output since uneven scaling isn't really a thing in the CRT realm. One last audio visual aspect to go over is the audio filter. Most cores are designed to very closely match original hardware audio characteristics, so this isn't necessary to use, strictly speaking. However, you may wish to more closely match certain aspects of the vintage sound environment or subjectively improve it by attenuating unwanted frequencies. As a simple example, NES consoles have a pretty strong low-pass filtering effect over RF output. And while I do like clean, unfiltered NES audio, something immediately felt super familiar and oh so right when I started playing around with the Mr.'s stronger audio filters. The 2kHz first order filter I used there wasn't necessarily designed for NES. MD Fourier shows us that it helps us get shockingly close to the NES RF sound signature. I do hear a slight difference, but it's mostly just down to noise. I mean, it never hit me before that NES RF sounds so different compared to the AV output, and I didn't even realize I was nostalgic for it, but I'm totally going to be using these filters on NES audio for Mr. from here on. I don't think there's any filter right now that's specifically designed for minimizing the unpleasant fuzziness of GBA audio without harming the quality of the sounds that you do want to hear, but honestly, when it comes to any core, don't be afraid to try filters in all kinds of different categories. It doesn't matter if they're labeled for arcade or something else, just try it. You know, I'll admit, I'm not exactly an audio guy, so let's dumb this down to my level. The smaller the kilohertz number, the less you'll hear of harsh higher frequencies. 
and the higher the order of passes, first, second, or third, the more aggressive the filter's muffling effect. The audio filters can also help reproduce aspects of the audio that are outside the hardware logic itself and would thus not be replicated directly via emulation, such as more closely matching the frequency range of vintage speakers. This is especially helpful for arcade games, which in my opinion often sound very harsh. The sound was designed this way because the cheap speakers and bodies of the cabinets themselves were expected to provide a sort of natural sound filtration. And with the low pass filters, especially the stronger second order filters, you can really recreate a sound that feels like it could be coming from a wooden arcade cabinet. So the long and short of it is that you should use whatever audio filter you want, whatever resolution you want, whatever picture sizing you want, and it'll all look great with the sharp interpolation filter. And with that, guess what? We've wrapped up class a bit early. And you know what that means? It's time to play some video games. So from here to the end of the video, we're just gonna kick back and check out the rest of the cores or at least as many as we can. But before we get to the course for computer, handheld, and arcade games, I need to sneak in a preview of sorts of what we can expect from Mr. in terms of the Holy Grails. People have fantasized about FPGA versions of early 3D consoles ever since the idea of FPGA-based hardware emulation started to become more mainstream. And things are looking very, very good for PlayStation 1 coming to Mr very soon. We're able to show you what the PS1 Mr. Core looks like directly thanks to Mr. Developer Robert Pipe's very open development process. Anyone can grab the latest beta versions from the PSX Core GitHub or the Mr. Discord. And yeah, PS1 is so close here that it's absolutely surreal. It's such a trip to see this little box that we've been playing NES and Neo Geo and stuff on for the past couple of years suddenly be able to produce 3D visuals that can be indistinguishable from the real thing. But yes, it's not ready to release just yet as of the time we're making this video, but it might not be too much longer before it gets properly released. In addition to save states, which are already implemented, one of the most interesting features is that there's a dithering toggle right there in the menu. Basically, you can trade off dither patterns for color banding, so it's not a straight win in all situations, but depending on the game's visuals and how the dithering is implemented, it can actually look pretty good with dithering off, so it's nice to be able to check how it looks in each game and see the difference immediately. There's even a widescreen hack, which actually expands the visible playfield for polygon graphics, but you would have to live with stretched 2D elements. I have spotted a few visual quirks when using this mode, but again, beta version, and I can't imagine that there will ever be a firm guarantee as to how beautifully such a feature would ever work from game to game. One feature that has got a lot of people talking is the data cache, which is essentially a boost mode that may slightly increase frame rates in many games. Watch the core's built-in FPS counter at the top left of each screen to see the difference. 
I mean, most of the time, I prefer accuracy over all else in emulation. I want to see the warts of the original hardware, but if this feature becomes proven over time without issues, I could be persuaded to use it. I mean, take this shot of the first battle in Chrono Cross. It lurches as low as 20 FPS with or without the data cache feature, but it climbs back faster and more often when it's on. And of course, I can't bring up Chrono Cross without acknowledging the Chrono Cross problem of games with 240p gameplay and 480i menus. That's taken care of handily here with the Sync 480i for HDMI feature, which prevents video drops when the game changes resolution. 480i content runs with either Bob or Weave deinterlacing over HDMI output, and considering the PS1 CPU alone takes up the vast, vast majority of the FPGA, I wouldn't count on any fancy motion adaptive deinterlacing, forced progressive scan, or anything like that. The big question mark with this core has long been whether it would be able to run on Mr. Systems without dual RAM expansions. PS1, of course, does not have a lot of RAM, but it does use a lot of memory bandwidth. So re-implementing that behavior on Mr. requires some workarounds. Well, turns out there's some great news. For all intents and purposes, the PlayStation Core has become fully functional for Mr. Systems with only a single stick of SD RAM, which is frankly a stunning achievement. There is, however, technically a difference in audio accuracy between dual RAM and single RAM versions of the core, but it's largely academic. Which is that audio may be processed one CPU cycle late on occasion, a difference that shouldn't be humanly perceptible in practice. I mean, listen to this scene from Crash Bandicoot Warped. Naughty Dog's sound design here is not perfect, and even on original hardware, I hear some minor hitches if I listen closely. And what I think is fascinating is that the hitches sound the same and are actually in the same places on my mister with only a single stick of SD RAM. And in my book, that is actually a super reassuring sign of accuracy. <laughs> Uka Uka is free. No, it cannot be. Evil, great evil has come. <laughs> Uka Uka is free. No, it cannot be. Evil, great evil has come. But of course, this is just a quick preview of the PlayStation Core, and we can't guarantee how things will work once it's officially released. But if you were concerned that you might have to switch to a digital I.O. board and grab an extra stick of SD RAM just for PS1, don't jump the gun just yet. Although, it's still possible that might be useful for other cores and features in the future. A Sega Saturn core also seems to be coming along quite nicely, but both that and PS1 are pushing the far limits of what can be done with a Mr. platform based around the DE10 Nano. Nintendo 64 seems to be completely off the table from a technical standpoint, so box up your hopes and dreams for an FPGA N64 and put them up in the attic for, I don't know, maybe a decade and then, and then check back in. So yeah, expect Saturn, PlayStation, maybe 3DO to be the biggest of the big boy consoles we'll ever see on DE10 based misters. Jaguar got close, but has RAM issues. Might could be solved, don't know for sure. But no matter what else comes in the future, it's safe to say that Mr.'s console support is already in a very good place. Oh yeah! You'll notice that we primarily focus on console cores up to this point. We are, after all, primarily console gamers, but to only hone in on that stuff would be leaving out a significant portion of the cores available on the Mr. Of course, I'm talking about PC gaming. From your typical Windows desktop to European microcomputers like the ZX Spectrum and even impressive Japanese systems like the Sharp X68000. There's a lot to explore here and I'm not afraid to admit that this is a pretty big blind spot for me overall. 
I'm gonna do my best to show you as much as I can, but please go easy on me if I sometimes am light on details. Also, keep in mind that this is a mister after all. It's powerful, but if you're expecting it to emulate hardware in a top-of-the-line Packard Bell 486 with a Voodoo 2 in it from 1998, then you've already set yourself up for total disappointment. The AO486 PC core, which can be used to run MS-DOS and some versions of Windows, is equivalent to around a 486SX33, maybe just a little bit faster. So we're talking around 33 to 66 megahertz here. If you were heavily into PC gaming when that was bleeding edge, then you're gonna have a great little trip down memory lane. The key difference between many computer cores and console cores is that instead of loading game ROMs, they mostly run off of .vhd files or virtual hard drive images. You'll generally mount those hard drive images and reset and apply the hard disk image and it will boot into it. Check out Lou's Retro Source on YouTube who has some great video resources for generating VHD files as well as walkthroughs on how to install different versions of Windows, MS-DOS, and more on them. Oh, by the way, CRT fans take note. PC games were made to be played on PC monitors. So more likely than not, the analog IO will be sending out a signal that is out of reach for a typical consumer CRT or even most PVMs. If you have a VGA PC monitor, then hey, go nuts. It should work just by plugging it straight in. It's from my old friend, Green Tentacle. He says that Purple Tentacles mutated into an insane genius. Wow. I forgot just how good PC games look on a proper monitor. Everyone else will probably just want to stick with HDMI though, which obviously looks great. However, screen tearing does rear its ugly head in many situations. Although I don't have enough experience with these on a real PC to know if it was present there as well. Alright, it's been a long, long time since I've used MS-DOS, and maybe it has been for you too. Or heck, maybe you've never even used it. Right now, the most accessible option for playing games on the AO486 core is the ExoDOS Top 300 collection, which gathers a boatload of games into a singular VHD file and has an updater script to easily sync compatibility fixes. There is a lot of interesting stuff to check out in this pack. But I was regularly reminded why I didn't take the PC gaming in quite the same way as I did with consoles. That's just me though, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people excited about this selection. How well a lot of these games run can be hit or miss. Doom is playable, but you probably won't get a super smooth frame rate without shrinking the screen size a bunch. The same goes for Hexen. Real-time strategy games, like Command and Conquer, play well and have included full motion video. But honestly, some of the best stuff to play here are the point and click graphical adventures, like the King's Quest games, Phantasmagoria, you remember this? and Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. It's obvious, but you'll need to use a mouse and keyboard to get the most out of this core. Personally, like I mentioned forever ago, I think it's pretty handy to use a Logitech unifying receiver and supported devices, because you can sync multiple input devices into one tiny USB dongle. Some games do support controllers, but if you enjoyed many of these games when they were new, then <laughs> you know how much of a crapshoot it can be. You have a few different kinds of controller types to choose from, but it's still hard to know which controller is gonna work with each game. A majority of these games were released well before the standardized button or key mappings that we have today. So this is a good opportunity to make use of the Mr's Per Game Customized Remapping function located on the Systems page of the Core's menu. 
Unfortunately, the specific mapping is reset when you leave a core, but <laughs> this'll do for now. <laughs> Controllers weren't the only variable you had to think about when it came to PC gaming. Sound devices were also a big thing. The AO486 supports a number of sound cards of the era, but those who had one know that nothing could make as beautiful of music as the Roland MT32 MIDI synthesizer. It figures, where there's a will, there's a way. The MT32 Pi brings MIDI LA and Sound Canvas capabilities to the Mister's different PC cores to deliver a rich musical experience. You'll need a compatible Raspberry Pi and special Pi hat to make this dream a reality, but it's really, really worth the extra effort. Connect the MT32 Pi to the user I.O. port, and that should unlock menu options and the cores that support it. A quick pointer though, the MT32 Pi needs an extremely, extremely short USB 3 Type A to A cable. Ideally, it'll be a half a foot or under. Now go ahead and boot up the secret of Monkey Island and take it all in. And trust me, there is a lot more where that came from. I had a Windows PC starting in the mid to late 90s, so I'm able to navigate that fairly well. But when it comes to some of the other computer cores, it'll be extremely obvious that I have little to no experience with most of them. So I've decided to ask for some help in covering some of the other heavy hitter, big deal computer cores. Hey there, Corey. Yeah, I'm pretty happy to be here today to talk to you about microcomputers, which is actually the most nostalgic part of my gaming childhood, if, believe it or not. And I mean, the last few years have been interesting for these units because there has been a lot of these mini consoles based around the C64 and now even the Amiga. And it's making these units more plug and play, whereas before it was a pretty intimidating emulation corner. But with the Mister, I guess that's why we're here, right? Let's take a look at how the Mister handles this little curvy wandering machine. Oh yeah. All right, uh, let's start with the one I'm most familiar with, Commodore 64. My brother had one of these, but I really have no recollection of how to actually start up a game. When you boot into the core, it takes you to a command prompt screen. Ah oh, yes, the good old C64 basic, Corey. This is where dreams come true when life begins. The first step into a new world. Yeah, so for those of us who grew up with the C64, this is actually quite a familiar and safe warm space. And I mean, in regards to games, this is where you would type in the load quotation mark star quotation mark 8.1 command, which is probably the most famous command in all of microcomputing. And what it basically does is load the first executable on any given disk. Alternatively, it looks like there's a built in shortcut for this shift and escape. I suppose it goes without saying that a keyboard is required for this core. Uh, actually, we should assume that this is the case for all computer cores. Oh, hey, looks like this core defaults to PAL. You can change this to NTSC if you go to the audio and video settings. Whoa there, silly Billy. Uh, let me just stop you right there because you actually want most of these microcomputer cores to be set to PAL. And the reason for this is basically because the games developed for these microcomputers were primarily coded for 50 Hz PAL displays in mind. So the game logic is actually tied to this, and only a handful of them were NTSC based. So the only real reason to run NTSC on C64 would be some of the aftermarket games, I guess. Huh. That actually makes complete sense when you consider that European developers were responsible for a vast majority of the games on it. Games were sold on two mediums for C64, uh, that being the five and a quarter inch floppy disks, which also makes for excellent coasters, according to my dad, and tapes. So the D64, the D81, those are the disk files, and then the T64 and the tap file extensions, those are the tape files. 
Now, I know some people out there are probably saying that, like, there were also cartridges, and that is true, but I feel like that's become more widespread nowadays, whereas back in the day, I never ever saw a cartridge, and I think maybe I had one, but, but no, this is all discs, baby. Not to mention you had to kind of stick those cartridges kind of awkwardly at the back of the system. Uh, speaking of which, I remember hearing something about needing to swap joysticks for some games. Why is this necessary? Yes, you'll actually see this throughout most of the microcomputer cores, actually. So I forget what the complete technical reason for this is, but I think it had something to do with the fact that, like, inputs from port 1 would cause some hardware interference with the overall machine and its performance. So devs had to start mapping stuff to controller port 2. And even though they fixed that problem in later revisions, just because it had become standard for so long, they kept it for port 2. There are some games that use port 1, but I mean, generally, uh, you have to use port 2. Uh, so you can do that by the little toggle, um, and it should be working. The audio and video section has settings for SIDS. I know this is the type of music that the C64 is famous for. Uh, any idea what the different settings do? Uh, SID music is life, my friend. Go listen to the art type theme from Chris Holzbeck and discover what real music sounds like. <laughs> so this is actually quite interesting because the C64 itself outputs mono sound, whereas the SID chip was a proper synthesizer chip actually and could produce quite excellent stereo music if it had the support for it and the hardware. There is some level of customization that can be set here to keep it close to the different SID models out there if you're so inclined though. This core actually does pretty well out of the box, I will say though. So, because the C64, it has to sound right. You can't play C64 without sounding right. And I quite enjoyed it. And I played a lot of C64 throughout my days. The Amiga is another much loved computer created by Commodore. I've never used a real one myself, but the core doesn't feel nearly as intimidating as the C64. Well, you don't find the Amiga intimidating? That's quite a surprise there, Corey, but... I mean, I think this would probably come down to the magic of VHD load, which, I mean, is a newer solution, a new in the sense that, like, you know, I think it's been more widespread now in later years than it was back then, at least generally. Uh, but basically, that it is a pre-configured, installed uh, little um, hard drive image in a way, I guess, to simple put. And it allows you to play these games out of the box with um, controllers and no disc swapping. And that, man, having grown up with the Amiga, uh, disc swapping was kind of part of that experience. So it's not really something I look back at fondly. So I, I greatly appreciate VHD load. <laughs> Oh, hey, check it out. Looks like you can easily mount different HDF images in the drive section of the OSD. The system section has lots of different hardware tweaks to choose from too, from CPUs, chipsets, and RAM setups. Yes, yeah, so you can save different configurations. Uh, I think CD32 games are supposedly supported, but right now there's a lot of hoops to jump through to get that working, and I couldn't really for the life of me get that running. It seemed like when I looked around, it was a bit compromised to run it. Yeah, so actually, I think the many ways that the Amiga handled audio and revolutionized like sampling and digital audio is one of the reasons to revisit and discover the machine today. Because I'm just not sure if you could say you've lived until you heard a stage 3 theme from Jim Power on an Amiga. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I would say, like, people should check these computers out, especially 64 and Amiga, it's just the music alone. Uh, the one thing I've noticed, though, though it might just be my ears, but the Amiga sound on the Mr. Core sounds quite soft. And with how Amiga actually handles stereo, which it was basically this very weird pan separation, uh, it's not anything like stereo you think of when you think of like a regular 2.0 it was very like separated between the channels so it's a little bit weird and it creates a lot of strange results um, depending on how experienced you are with the system so i think these are like kinks that can be smoothed out over time since you know that's how a mystery keeps evolving anyway
Finally, we have the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. This is the core that made me realize that maybe I needed some help with this segment. This is really a beast. Yeah, it's easy to see why this could make a person's head spin. It's okay, I won't judge you for that at least. But there's a lot going on here. There's tons of game mediums supported, like with the CZT4. There's lots of different hardware configurations and peripherals. There's different joysticks. But yeah, it, it can be a lot. Games on the Spectrum have a really interesting look to them. You kind of had to grow up with the Specky to get it, because my friend had one and I basically saw that as like a fungus infested spongy tumor that he had in his basement that I really just didn't want to touch or be around. Whereas he, you know, saw it as a gateway to life's greatest thrills. And Spectrum games are quite interesting in how they simply operate, like the way they look, the, the logic in the games. It is fascinating, and for this core it's interesting too, because it's one of those systems where you actually have to keep in mind what type of CPU you use, and overclocking, it's one of the first examples of that. Because different uh, speckies had different clocks, uh, depending on like the model, and the later games obviously would target higher clocks, but would run on uh, smaller machines, or older machines. So you want to look at like the megahertz down there, toggle it around because the game that looks super choppy to you to the point where like you can't play this with like what were they thinking? Uh, it might just be that it requires like a near revision and it, then it plays smoothly. And I joke about this Becky, but damn, it has probably one of the coolest homebrew scenes in the retro space. I mean, you look at Castlevania, Final Fight gets ported over. I mean, there was an old Final Fight which we covered in DF Retro. I mean, this new Mighty Final Fight uh, version is just incredible. And then you have like the Power Blade 2 port that has like incredible music. And that goes for most of this homebrew stuff. It's just like, I didn't know the spec it could sound like this. Fans of the system might be interested to check out the ZX Next Core, which is a more powerful and modern version of the hardware that has an active development scene. Interestingly, this is the only core that makes use of the extra SD card slot on your I.O. board. It's a theoretical but physical real what-if console that targets new hardware and allows you to run kind of like Super Nintendo-ish looking games, like a PC Engine level games. and. If the mystery can run this with ease, that means that like for aftermarket games, the mystery is like one of the easiest gateways to that. And that's just amazing because then it opens a whole new market with that little device. So I really like this idea. I mean, just listen to me because I'm sitting here right now being excited for Spectrum stuff. And if just a few years ago, that would be a great cause of concern because like Alzheimer runs in my family. But it's thanks to the mister now that like, no, it's a viable option and I can play specky stuff and not feel bad about it. Moving on to Japanese computers, I'd like to think that maybe they're easier to get a handle on. Let's look at the MSX first. So the MSX core contains hardware emulation for like the original MSX, MSX2, MSX2 Plus, Turbo R. And these are actually quite different machines, and since the MSX also uses like tapes and ROM cassettes and diskettes and even laser discs in some cases, you just know that this can be an interesting but challenging core. And I think it's been challenging until fairly recently where I've seen some uh, updates with like uh, the virtual hard drives and making it a little bit easier. Yeah, I struggled with it a lot early on. 
but recent virtual hard drive images have made it much easier to get into games at least. Yeah, so I still think that this is a core that would benefit from a bit more of an expansive and better message UI option since the between the system and game mediums, the MSX can become probably the most vivid and interesting machine you've ever experienced. Just tons of games on there, tons of software. If you want to take a deep dive into what's good on the MSX and the benefits of the different hardware revisions, Displaced Gamers has an absolutely top of the line video on the subject that I cannot recommend enough. Next, we were originally going to talk about the NEC PC88 core, but you know, it is really, really new. So it's probably for the best that we give it time to mature first. Instead, let's jump over to my personal favorite computer core, the Sharp X68000. I don't know if you know this, Corey, but if you look at my Twitter handle and stuff, you might recognize that the NEC computers have a pretty special place in my heart. So I'm sure one day we can return to this as they mature, because I think there's a lot to talk about with PC88 and 98 and things like this. And it makes me excited what can be done. Uh, but mm, rather than sit here and say what it can't do, I'd rather wait till it's in a place where we can talk about what it can do. Now what is exciting to talk about though is the X68 core, because that's been in various states of development over the last couple of years. And I mean, they got a huge overhaul in like 2021 it looks like, because damn, this was a lot better than the last time I tried with John Lindman. And there's still rough edges around here, but it's in great shape overall. I was quite surprised by this. There really isn't a ton to cover here, at least option-wise. You can load .d88 floppy disk files and SASI hard drive images, which tend to load a lot faster than floppy disks. CRT output is definitely odd, but it was the same way on original hardware. It outputs at both 15 kHz and 31 kHz, so you'll need a multi-sync monitor to get the most out of it. My 480p capable L5 series PVMs work okay with it for the most part, as long as you set the video frequency to original in the core's audio and video settings. I still get these little squiggles though. I'm gonna let you finish, but listen, we need to talk about just how awesome the games are on this machine, because there's some really amazing games on this that are completely mind-blowing, and not enough people know the magic of X68. Uh, yeah, the music is what really hooked me here. The first time I tried out Bosconian, I got literal goosebumps from how good the music was. Hello. 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 Some games use the MT32 Pi to take things to an astronomical level. I initially got one of these to use for the AO486 core but the X68000 is where it was really, really worth the effort. So for someone like myself who doesn't really have a real grasp on the games that came out for the X68000, what are some titles do you think that people should seek out? Man, there's so many. But like Asuka 120, uh, Mad Stalker of course, uh, you have stuff like uh, Geograph Seal which is an early jumping flash uh, thingy with incredible music, uh, Aqualus. There's a lot of cool stuff on the X68. This is, this is a core where I would sit down and just whatever sounds interesting load it up see what you get because it's just magical to look through this library there's a lot of shooters though 
a lot of shooters. And I'm active at shooters. <sighs> Thanks for your help with that. I have excruciatingly little real world experience with any of those platforms. And there is no way I'd be able to show them off properly. Oh, it's my pleasure, buddy. And I mean, my takeaway from this is basically that while the Mister is a fantastic device, and I'm pretty impressed by what's already been done here, I think these microcomputers are a little bit of a different beast from the consoles, and they do need a different amount of customization, just due to the, how the sound works, the graphics, all these things. And I think perhaps this scrollable UI that's there now Perhaps it's a little bit too intimidating, especially for those who are not used to these machines, to get into. But what's here is fantastic. There's so much potential, and I had a lot of fun checking out the microcomputers on the Mister. And I would definitely keep tabs on this uh, development and help out make this experience even better, so that people can still enjoy these fantastic machines. Thanks, Corey. Earlier, Corey talked about the Master System Core, which doubles as the Game Gear Core. I should point out that right now at least, handheld platforms are categorized among consoles on Mister. So what else do we have aside from Game Gear? Well, I'm told that you should not expect Nintendo DS to be possible on Mister, but I would unironically love to see a Virtual Boy Core someday. And Hotego is actually working on a Neo Geo Pocket Core right now. But while we wait for that, we have Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Wonder Swan, and Atari Lynx. Now, you might be itching to point out that, in addition to the Shogi games, actually, Super Game Boy is not supported by the Super Nintendo Core, and you'd be right. But over here in the Game Boy Core, we see that oh, Super Game Boy Enhanced Palettes are supported! I make no secret of my deep love of these amazing palettes that can change from scene to scene and even define different color palette regions within the screen. And how frustrating it is that Nintendo has never supported them in any way other than on the SNES itself. You can also use the Super Game Boy borders, although I prefer not to unless you're outputting to a CRT where the 144p picture would be small within the 240p output frame regardless. The only disappointment here is that Super Game Boy Enhanced sound effects are not supported. These are not nearly as impactful or as common as the palettes, and I'm told that this feature would be difficult to implement. But something that I would like to see addressed, if at all possible, is that the fallback sound effects, the ones that play when not using Super Game Boy, only play on Mister when not using the Super Game Boy palette. So yeah, it would be nice to be able to use the palette and at least hear the regular sound effect in this case. As for Game Boy games with no Super Game Boy enhancements, you can use any palette in a .gbp format. Many are included in the Mr. Update process, most of which are based on Super Game Boy presets alongside others such as the requisite DMG palette. It's not my favorite interpretation of DMG screen colors I've ever seen, but it's pretty solid. I do know that Sho, who put together that set of NES palettes, is also working on curating a larger selection of Game Boy palettes, so hopefully even more good ones will be included in the updates in the future. If you want a good LCD effect, you can choose the handheld.matrix preset, which loads in the filter called LCD Effect BR01HV. It's pretty nice and also works properly at non-integer sizing, but it's not perfect. You could experiment with other filters though, and hopefully even better options will come in the future. This core is of course where you also play Game Boy Color games, and you have a binary choice of raw or corrected colors. I don't know what kind of process went into creating the color correction here, so I don't know what kind of accuracy or authenticity claims could be made, but I do like the results. 
Oh, and if you want to use the GBA features of the very few GBC games that have them, a new function allows you to activate that mode right here in the regular Game Boy Core. You'll also find that aside from Game Gear, support for save states is already very consistent across all of Mr.'s handheld cores. And sometimes there are even fast forward and rewind functions like with the Game Boy Core. But one of the wildest things that you can do with Game Boy games on the Mr. isn't even in the Game Boy Core. It's in a separate core called Game Boy 2P. This manages to run two Game Boys in the hardware connected via a virtual link cable. We haven't used it extensively, and the way it works is rather hacky, we're told. And I'll believe it, we did have a hard time getting some games to work with it at all. Watch for the end of this versus mode match in Super Mario Bros. Deluxe to see how everyone's a winner. Could that happen on original hardware? At any rate, it's a neat core to see working here at all, but I have to admit, I don't trust the current version of it too much. It's easy to forget that the Game Boy Advance is actually a 32-bit system, so it was definitely impressive to see when the Mr. Core was released. For the most part, there's nothing too crazy going on with this core on the surface. It just works, and it works great. One thing I do appreciate, though, is that more choices are available for how you might modify the colors compared to Game Boy Color games in the Game Boy Core. Oh, and one Game Boy Core feature that I didn't mention previously, which is also available here as well, is a frame blending effect to eliminate the rapid flicker of certain visual effects that are intended to be pseudo transparencies. This can also help prevent flicker retention on some IPS displays, but motion will be blurrier overall, so you might not want to always use it. There is one unique feature on the GBA Core though that I think a lot of people will have fun with. You can choose to render scaling and rotation effects at twice the resolution on each axis, either on backgrounds, sprites, or both. Most of the time this does nothing visible, but you'll see it in situations where there are background layers manipulated for a 3D effect, like in racing games, or when a sprite is rotated and scaled. It's a pretty interesting effect, and no other Mr. Core does anything quite like it to my knowledge. There's no such feature implemented into the SNES core, at least not at the moment, but we can get a sort of tease as to what this would possibly look like thanks to the GBA's plethora of SNES ports. This could cause visual issues in some games, and in general, I would personally play with this effect off since the mixture of low-res and high-res imagery coexisting in the same frame isn't really to my personal taste but it's just one of those cool above and beyond sorts of things that lets you manipulate the hardware in an interesting way and gives you a peek into what could be possible. Games that use special cartridge hardware are supported to some extent. WarioWare Twisted's gyro sensor can be operated fairly well with a controller's left analog stick, but you'll have to get used to just how little you actually need to move it. The more basic sensor used in games like Yoshi Topsy Turvy also technically works with an analog stick, but since you also have to use the D-pad and buttons in this game, it's pretty unplayable. Not that I've ever really heard good things about how fun it is or is not on a real GBA either. It's too bad that actual gyro sensors in Wii remotes or modern PlayStation controllers don't work with these games. Maybe someday? Fans of Konami's Boktai games will be pleased to know that a customizable solar sensor percentage setting appears in the hardware menu when those games are loaded up. Oh, and of course, real-time clock features are also supported. No big challenge there. However, I believe games that support rumble, either through cartridge hardware like with Drill Dozer or simply via a GameCube controller on the Game Boy Player, are totally rumbleless on Mr. for now at least. As with Game Boy, you can also run a separate GBA 2P core with fewer options to play two-player link cable games on the same mister and the same screen with two controllers. Again, neither of us have exactly used it a lot, so I don't know if it's possible you might run into any issues, but it just seems super impressive to me to see two instances of a 32-bit system running on FPGA here. <laughs> Thank you.
The Wonder Swan by Bandai was a modestly successful family of handheld systems sold only in Japan at a very competitive price point against the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. I actually very, very recently came to own a Wonder Swan Color with an IPS screen mod thanks to Emblink supporter Fenris Wolf Retro, which by the way doesn't seem to have the flicker retention issues of most of the Game Boy GBC and GBA screen mods I've tested despite probably using pretty much the same type of screen, just thought that was interesting. But anyway, as a newcomer to the Wonder Swan, I'm curious about what types of games I might consider buying for it. So it's wonderful to see a Wonder Swan core on the Mister so I can explore the library a bit more. Wonderswan initially did not support color, so games come in both grayscale and color flavors. Right now, you can't colorize the older Wonderswan games in Mister, but I for one wouldn't mind seeing some Game Boy style palette options. The Wonderswan system and screen actually operate at around 75 Hz, so we might have to tweak a few things to get desirable results. I found that my computer monitor was able to sync up to the 75 Hz output mode, but then I would get screen tearing unless I also checked sync core to video. Then it's pretty perfect, but it likely looks rather juddery in this video due to it being 60 frames per second on YouTube. Do you think the superiority of playing Final Fantasy IV at 75 frames per second on Wonderswan Color versus a measly 60 frames per second on Game Boy Advance was fiercely debated among Japanese youth in the early 2000s? I bet it happened at least once. It is very possible though that you'll have to use a 60 hertz refresh rate to get a usable picture on some displays or capture cards. And with this, I'm not sure if there's any particularly acceptable workaround. You can choose sync core to video, which restores smooth scrolling and is probably the only truly smooth scrolling that will display in the YouTube video, but it also slows the game way down. To be clear, I don't exactly know how accurate it is when the core speed is also synced to the 75 Hz mode, but any possible variation in that range would be small enough that it would be acceptable to me. So 75 Hz is the way to play, in my opinion, if your display is compatible. One cool aspect of the Wonderswan platform is this designed to be held in a conventional horizontal layout or be flipped into TAME! <laughs> <laughs> Some games even use both modes, requiring you to flip the screen during gameplay, but luckily the Mr. Core takes this into account and you can choose to have the screen automatically rotate depending on the game content. However, I was getting sync drops whenever this happened, so I had to edit the V-Sync adjust to match core frequency, which makes the transition work a bit better, but you're pretty safe either way since the games tend to prompt you to change your grip and confirm before moving on, like in Ghosts and Goblins here. I also found that, for whatever reason, I needed to turn on buffer video to eliminate screen tearing in Tate mode, but that was not necessary for me in the standard mode. You don't need to worry about your D-pad orientation on the button mapping side of things. Your D-pad directions will translate to Tate mode without any fuss. Mapping the Y buttons is more confusing, but I found that if you put Y3 on a button you'd be comfortable using for attacking and Y1 on a button you'd be comfortable using for jumping, that should generally work out okay. But this is one case where you may need to make several per game button assignments if you find yourself playing a bunch of different Wonderswan games. Now, if you want to see some real big chunky pixels on your mister, look no further than the Atari Lynx core. That's right, we've saved the lowest resolution handheld core for last. Although, while its 102p resolution pales in comparison to the Game Boy's 144p, the Lynx somewhat made up for it by supporting color. As with the Wonderswan, you may need to fiddle a bit with the settings to see what you can do to minimize tearing and judder. Links can also go into Tate mode, although here there's no option for automatic rotation and you need to select the orientation manually. 
but the situation with Lynx can be far more convoluted due to the system supporting refresh rates ranging from around 50 hertz to over 75 hertz, according to the GitHub page for the Mr. Core. I hear that in practice, most games are probably around 60 hertz, but reliable information on this is pretty difficult to come by, so take that with a grain of salt. You definitely need to turn on the buffer feature in order to not get screen tearing, which of course adds some lag, but it's necessary to have a presentable experience. You can also choose to sync the core to 60 hertz, but this does tamper with the game speed if that matters to you. I've found that most Lynx games I've tested don't have particularly smooth scrolling anyway, even when synced to the refresh output, so I don't think that this is particularly necessary unless you do need to activate for display or capture card compatibility. Basically, the Lynx and Wonderswan cores both may require you to do some settings fiddling depending on your setup, tolerances for screen tearing, stuttering, and input lag, as well as potentially on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the game. Otherwise, you have save states, cheats, and even a 240p mode for displaying a larger picture on CRTs. I don't exactly have much experience with Lynx. Corey's the one who actually had one as a kid, but I'm definitely happy to have some kind of access to it through the Mister here. Oftentimes, it's these very borderline systems, the ones that made just enough of a splash to be notable but are lacking in compelling reasons to buy into the original hardware that are the ones that I'm most curious to explore with Mister. Some of my fondest memories of growing up are being given a couple of bucks to spend at the arcade while my mom went clothes shopping or something like that at the mall. Would I blow it all on some tried and true favorites? Or would there be something new that I'd never seen before, which would soon have me pining for a home console version? Potential for arcade cores was a thing that initially drew my interest to the Mister in 2018, but I had no idea how viable some of my favorites from the 80s and 90s would have actually been on the hardware. Here in 2022, I can say that without a doubt, the arcade games are easily my favorite part of the Mister and have far exceeded even my wildest dreams. The thing is, each arcade PCB is essentially a console. In the Mr. World, that means that each would need to be, more or less, yep, its own core. As we've seen over the course of this episode, a staggering amount of work goes into making sure a core runs as authentically as possible, while still being relatively easy to use. To apply a similar amount of work to simply being able to run one single game, it makes complete sense that in the early days of the Mister, arcade cores were pretty sparse. A mixture of icons like Space Invaders, Pac-Man, and Galaga, and some slightly more obscure titles. Resourceful developers would eventually learn to reuse standardized base chipsets with the creation of multiple games, adding more powerful hardware on a per-case basis as it was needed. This approach gave us some of the most celebrated arcade platforms of all time like the Sega System 16 and Capcom's CPS. For Mr. Development, what this means is that cores could be created for more broad platforms. Sure, some custom tailoring is usually needed for each game, but at the very least, you'd have a foundation in place to support a number of games right out of the gate. As of 2022, thanks to some insanely brilliant and savvy Mr. Developers, well over 150 games have been released giving us a selection of cores that encompass a staggering list of all-timers, hidden classics, and influential trailblazers, with more being added regularly. Since the cores are from many different developers, you're not likely to find a standardized set of options from game to game. Some have extremely robust options, while others might seem bare bones. Most of these options actually come from the arcade PCB's built-in dip switches, 
These little guys were there so the arcade operator could tweak various options for the player. From game difficulty to number of coins that are needed to play. I love that these are there for completeness, although you might find that some options have little use outside of an actual arcade. Dip settings are important to keep in mind when you run into an odd situation, like, hey, your screen's upside down. There will be a dip for that. Although, if you're using an analog I.O. going out to a CRT, these games will show up just as they did originally. Games that made use of a vertically oriented TV will be that way on the mister, as they should be. Arcade games often took advantage of the malleable nature of analog video to do some really odd things. Many cores have specific settings to center the analog output since you can't always expect the image to be handled equally on every CRT. Since HDMI output can be scaled and rotated as you please, it's not as strict as the analog output. With the downside of vertically oriented games being a little small or having a ton of shimmering. So don't forget to employ that interpolation and save it in every single arcade core. While a digital signal might benefit in that regard, it might struggle with some of the arcade cores that run at an odd refresh. Refresh rates can vary wildly from game to game and some HDTVs have a tougher time than others reconciling it, especially if your mister is set to low lag mode. If certain arcade games are being problematic, try setting your mister's V-Sync adjust to zero. You might have a frame or two of lag, but hey, at least you can see the game. Try got into the audio filters a while ago, but it bears repeating that arcade games are where they really shine. The sound you heard coming from those wooden cabinets is something you'll never forget even if it was barely audible over the white noise of dozens of machines running at the same time. The audio filters are especially important because the likelihood of there ever being versions of MD Fourier programmed to run on each arcade board is pretty slim, at least in our lifetime. Who knows, experimenting with the different audio filters might trigger some long dormant emotions. Certain games have a more filtered sound built in by default. This is especially the case with Donkey Kong, whose muffled sounds are such a key part of its identity, the hamster recreated it in their arcade archives release on the Nintendo Switch. the most prolific arcade core developer is Jose Tejada, most commonly known as Hotego. He's responsible for many of the biggest arcade releases in the Mister's repertoire. You can always identify a Hotego core from the JT emblem in the background of the menu. Early on, it was his CPS-1 core that generated a ton of excitement around what might be possible with the Mister's arcade development. The Capcom System 1 had some incredibly memorable games. No doubt you know about Final Fight. This game has been emulated a number of times across different systems over the years, and none as good as this. Strider is another personal favorite of mine, and the Mister might just have the most arcade perfect version to appear anywhere. During the opening level, the Starfield background has never been accurately recreated in any port or emulation before, not even by Capcom themselves. Thanks to the research done for the Mr. Core, this information is now public, so future releases can use it. And of course, we have Street Fighter 2. The CPS-1 was the home of the first three versions of SF2, the World Warrior, Champion Edition, and Hyper Fighting. Otago upped the ante with CPS 1.5 and CPS-2 cores in 2021, which not only brings in the rest of the Street Fighter 2 versions, but the Alpha series too. In fact, the CPS housed many of the absolute best fighting games of all time, such as Darkstalkers and the Versus series, X-Men vs. Street Fighter through Marvel vs. Capcom. These cores are considered to be so close to their arcade counterparts 
that the fighting game community has begun to regularly use the Mister as a stand-in for real hardware in tournaments. Over time, Hotego and his team have focused on incorporating features from the original hardware, like Q-Sound, which is a 3D sound processing algorithm. And that is just the Capcom stuff. Hotego and his team have been doling out both public and beta cores on a nearly weekly basis. In recent months, we've seen a bunch of Data East games, like Bad Dudes and Robocop. Bringing us closer and closer to Karnov. My personal favorite, Sega's System 16, which housed some seminal titles of my youth, like Golden Axe and Altered Beast, recently left beta and is now publicly available. It's pretty cool that M2's custom arcade remake of Fantasy Zone 2 even works in this core. But it's not just Hotego. There are some incredibly dedicated geniuses that deserve just as much recognition for their hard work in bringing my favorite arcade games to the mister. Because of all of you, I feel like every day could be my birthday. You never know what sort of gifts will show up. The Dodon Pachi Core from Null Object is hopefully the starting point for a slew of Cave's bullet hell shooters to arrive on mister. Null Object also developed and released the Tecmo Core, which will play Rygar and Silkworm, among others. The Sega System 1 Core from Mr. X lets you play some of the Sega's earlier arcade titles, like The Ninja and, of course, Wonder Boy. Other Mr. X developed cores include Namco's Dig Dug, Tecmo's Solomon's Key, and Russian Attack from Konami. The list goes on and on. So let's just do this. Here's a look at a bunch of games that are either available now or on the way. What sort of arcade games could the future hold? I'm sure it's only a matter of time before some Midway classics start showing up. NARC, NBA Jam, and of course the first three Mortal Kombat games. I am personally hoping for some of the Sega Super Scalar arcade games. Or maybe some Namco System 1 and 2 games. The list could keep on going though. Hey, how about, how about a hard drive in core? Anyone? Anyone? Or just me? I don't know, it sounds awesome. Well, no matter how long this video has been, I'm sure a ton of people can't believe we forgot to talk about this or forgot to talk about that. Mister is simply too vast to give every facet the full attention it deserves. But hopefully this has satisfied longtime Mister fanatics and curious newcomers alike. If you're looking for more information or tutorials on how to do specifics, there are tons of resources out there. It definitely seems probable that Mr. will be built exclusively around the DE10 Nano for a good long time to come for both cost and availability reasons. So I wouldn't hesitate to jump in because you think surely something in a year or two might come along that could magically do PS2 and GameCube and Xbox all at higher resolutions and stuff like that. That ain't happening on any hardware you could afford anytime remotely soon. And that's to say nothing of the reverse engineering challenges, even if the hardware were available. If the sky's the limit, then that stuff is definitely in outer space right now. And sure, there are many other ways to play these games and emulate games from newer consoles too. Mister isn't going to be the right approach for everyone, and that's okay. 
But hopefully we've helped you see that this type of hardware emulation is not only interesting and important, but also not that difficult to use. The Mister has become a pretty complete and fully featured platform in just a few short years, and we can't wait to see where it goes next. Thank you.